Hey everybody, welcome to a new club chat. Today we're going to talk about Ikuhara's new work, Sadazanmaya. We're going to tell you what it's about and what our thoughts on it are. Uh, I'm Sam. And I'm Kyle. And we're going to dive right in. So first off, here's a spoiler warning because this show just came out. Uh, we don't expect that everybody's seen it. So yeah, um, if we're going to do analysis, it's kind of spoilers for the entire series. If you have not seen it, don't watch this video because you should always kind of go into Ikuhara works relatively blind. Uh, so yeah, this is the newest uh, Ikuhara work since... Uh, when, when when did Yuri Kuma come out? Yuri Kuma came out 2015. Yeah, so it's been a few years, uh, and this is our newest, freshest thing from uh, The Dark Father. Uh, the Dark Father. Kunihiko Ikuhara. It is very much a show built on connection as its basis. It is a, a show about connecting to others, connecting with different people, from different uh, different slides of life and what that means. And so we have our three boys, uh, Kazuki, Toei, and Enta, and how each of them managed to connect with one another despite the, the various hurdles in their lives. Also, there's some magic shit with Kappas. There's always some weird magic shit when it's Ikuhara. There's always something crazy going on. And speaking of hurdles, there is one thing that I want to get out in front of as soon as possible. So like, if you saw the first episode of Sadazanmai, you know that this show goes to some weird places. There's uh, a lot of butt stuff, which mm -hmm. is not something a whole lot of people expect to see. Um, shame is like a really big theme in this show, for sure. Like, we can't understate, you know, this show gets a little bit kind of grotesque at times. Not in a, like, disgusting gore kind of way, but in a sort of... It's challenging to watch those first couple of episodes, but once you adjust to sort of the Ikuhara weirdness scale of this particular work, you'll come to appreciate the greater themes at work and the greater message that's being put across here. I think the, like, best way to talk about the themes of these shows and to sum them up nicely is kind of going with those old kind of sayings where it's like, in order to be loved, you need to be known. And that yes. is one hell of a trial, because being known is a terrifying thing. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, that is the crux of what Sadazanmai is about. It's not just about connecting, but it's about how hard it can be to connect, and mm -hmm. what one has to overcome in order to forge connections with people. We see this greater clash of these two major ideals, this connection versus desire. Uh, two forces that are constantly opposing one another, but in a way both are present in like each of our main characters even each of them struggle with that uh from the early the early show all the way to the end and it becomes very apparent that no one person is without their shame or their desires that fuel their actions and so to truly connect with others you have to tear down those walls and expose yourself and expose your truth in order to really let yourself be known like sam said oh yeah for sure and I think, like, a great place to kind of start with digging into the show is with the first episode. And the first Kappa zombie we see is obsessed with boxes, which then translates to the box that each of the boys have, the uh, Kappa zone boxes, and how um, each of the items in there is symbolic of a connection, but it's also symbolic of a desire. In a way, while the boxes themselves are sort of stand-ins in the early series, um, they are actually meant to... Uh, symbolize the greater desires that each of the boys hold dear and the way that they are sort of obscured to the world. Everybody's carrying around these boxes, they are ever present in the world, and within each is someone's own personalized symbol of desire, kind of like a totem, yep. in a way. Yep, and like we see that pop up all over the series. Each of the Kappa Zombie items is, like, a, a totem is a good way to describe it, and that's probably the term we're going to be using here. Um, mm -hmm. Because, like, these things are their desires, but they aren't literally their desires. They're emblematic of those desires. And Absolutely. While the Kappa zombies are completely consumed by desire, they are just collecting these totems. Um, the boys each have their one precious totem they're hanging on to in hopes of uh, fulfilling their desire. So with Kazuki, of course, you have the box that is containing his uh, Sada costume. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course... He's using that to quote-unquote connect with his little brother Haruka, except mm -hmm. through the course of the series we find out that there's nothing good coming from that situation. He's lying to his little brother. He's only doing that to alleviate guilt from himself. I mean, in the first few episodes even, we see Haruka really trying to 
like, be happy and talk to his brother. He wants to be around his brother. And Kazuki will barely even look at him. Mm -hmm. And on one hand, you do have, like, Kazuki who's feeling a lot of guilt. He even says at one point, every time he sees Haruka's wheelchair, he can't breathe. But at the same time, there isn't a true effort being made there, you know? He doesn't feel safe doing that, he's too afraid, and so he's depending on a lie to connect to Haruka, which he's not doing at all in the end. Yeah. And, like, further on that, the idea of... Uh, Kazuki makes it very clear at the beginning of the series he wants to do whatever he can to make Haruka's life better and to improve, like, to cheer him up in any way, going so far as dressing up as Sada and lying to his own brother. And then even earlier on, stealing a cat from another family and raising it as their own. It, it's, it's very clear that the methods by which Kazuki is going about cheering up his brother and doing whatever it can, he's not exactly doing ethical things. The methods are shady and all of it is done out of guilt. And so that is where the desire is born from here. While the, the, main, the main message is, I want to connect to my brother, it's the it's all a means to an end essentially it's all to make up for what he feels he has done and what he owes his brother now mm -hmm. it's not coming from a pure place really um mm -hmm. whereas haruka as we see when he's kidnapped by uh neo haruka is coming from a very pure place of wanting to connect and like truly loving his brother and this isn't limited to kazuki each of the boys has their box, and even though on the outset they may seem like they're uh, totems of love rather than desire, each of them is going about it in a way that's toxic to them and that ultimately is only going to get them hurt further. Um, so mm -hmm. then moving on to Enta, we have he, his uh, Masanga. And so Enta's deal is that he's in love with Kazuki, plain and simple. Yeah. And he wants Kazuki to get over his depression over his little brother and become the golden duo with him again. He wants... Kazuki to be the perfect Kazuki that Enta has in his mind, um, when in reality things are going to be a lot more complicated than that and, you know, he can't really fit Kazuki into this role, you know? He can't make Kazuki into the person that he wants him to be. Mm -hmm. Eventually we see Enta come to accept that, but we'll explore that a little bit and how each of the boys accept these things later on. Um, yeah. For now, let's talk a little bit about Toei. And Toei has a very, very strong uh, narrative arc. He's definitely my favorite. Uh, Toei's object is a gun. Mm -hmm. Toei's is, I feel, the most blatant of the uh, the negative aspects to the connection that they're pursuing because Toei is trying to connect with his brother who is a criminal. Chikai is a very shady individual, but he's also, he desperately cares for his younger brother and he's trying to do everything he can to protect his younger brother and give him a better life. But Toei, in complete opposition, wants to do everything he can to ensure Chikai has a better life and stays by his side at all times. So the two are kind of working against each other yeah, in a weird way. It's honestly really tragic because they both want to protect and care for the other at any cost to themselves. However, that puts them in direct opposition because they're both kind of sometimes literally throwing themselves in the line of fire to protect the other. Yeah. Which then, of course, ends up with Chikai dying and Toei kind of going off the deep end for a little bit. Exactly. And so in pursuing this connection with his older brother, Toei ends up giving himself a really, I don't want to say awful life, but an unfortunate life where he is subjecting himself to all of this, you know, shady underbelly of the world. He's doing crimes, he's taking part in a drug trade, he's, uh, he's like waterboarding someone at one point, like he is very clearly ruining his life so to speak and it's 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 his pursuing of a relationship with his older brother that has kind of given him an unsavory lifestyle that isn't really healthy for him and though he can't see it it's it's still very much a negative negative impact on his life thus mm -hmm. building into this idea of it being less about connection and more about desire oh for sure one thing I do want to point out, since we're talking about Toei and Chikai, Sadazanmai loves puns and, like, wordplay. Mm -hmm. And now, I'm not great at Japanese, I'm not a native Japanese speaker, so there are probably tons of things I missed here, but one bit of uh, wordplay within the series is the fact that Chikai is Toei's brother and they their family runs a soba shop. Chikai and soba are the same as some words that um, have to do with being near someone in proximity. They're not exactly the same, but it's about being near someone when those words are used not as names or as an object, but in their other sense. So yeah, there's some very thematic naming going on with um, Toei's whole arc there. Oh yeah, there's a lot of that 
ever present in all of Setas on my end. I guess Ikuhara works as a whole. It's very, he's very good at making sure things are, you know, like cleverly named within the context of the show. Mm -hmm. Usually very tight writing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so going off of what you mentioned a little earlier about the unfortunate end to um, this whole connection between Chikai and Toei, each one of our characters here faces a unfortunate end to the desire or the connection that they're trying to pursue. And Toei's is the most, I feel, unfortunate of the batch. Someone dies. He straight up loses his brother and that connection is ultimately severed. But in each case, the unfortunate end to all of these connections are the ultimate consequence to their actions and to the desires that they have been pushing forward throughout the series. Oh, for sure. With Kazuki, he is exposed to his brother and to his family as the fake Sada, especially in front of a crowd of people. And that that is his lies finally coming forward and exposed to the one person that he's been trying to protect and trying to be trying to keep all of this information from. Uh, it is the literal worst case for him and makes for a very awkward and unfortunate scene. But mm -hmm. after after being exposed like this, that's when he starts to pursue a more honest and true connection with his younger brother. Yep, and that's the thing, like, he, they all have to hit rock bottom before they're able to, you know, heal and become better people. So then, mm -hmm. Kazuki actually gets his, um, arc finished, uh, kind of. You know, there's the rest of the show that he's in, but his arc and his emotional journey finishes, um, after he saves Haruka. Um, so mm -hmm. just a little bit after he's exposed, after he hits rock bottom, then he gets his chance to come back. Enta is the next one to kind of begin this character arc by hitting rock bottom, and the way that Enta goes about it is by getting shot, by getting basically yeah. murdered. He is so willing, this entire time, uh, Enta has been so willing to do anything for Kazuki that that reaches its ultimate conclusion by Enta dying for Kazuki, so to speak. He's willing to sacrifice his life for an ideal that'll never be, and he, he needs that to eventually come to a point where he's willing to accept his relationship with Kazuki as it is, which we see him mm -hmm. do just a few episodes later after uh, being overcome with uh, the Desire Otter. I don't know how to yeah. refer to him, the Otter. Uh, when he's possessed by the otter, he ultimately rejects uh, desire and decides, no, I want things to stay how they are. You know, I treasure mm -hmm. my connection with Kazuki and I'd rather keep that than give in to desire and ruin my chances. Oh, absolutely. Uh, a quick aside or a quick uh, sidebar for Enta, uh, a, an interesting part of the, the whole desire debacle with him. Um, his is, I feel, the most subtle of the three in why his his pursuing of his connection uh, his connection with Kazuki I feel it's it's a more subtle version of desire in in that it is uh, he presents himself as someone who is willing to do whatever he can to make Kazuki happy he is uh, he acts very selfless with regard to his good friend and his crush in that he says oh I will do whatever it takes to make him smile I want him to be happy again he even says that he will use all the dishes of hope to grant Kazuki's wish. It's a very selfless act, but unfortunately, the truth behind the matter is these are all a means to an end. It is fairly selfish in that everything that he wants to do is to restore the status quo between those two, uh, to reform the golden duo so that both of them can be close again. So the actions that, Kaz uh, that Enta takes throughout the series start to reveal themselves, especially in the episode, um, I want to connect, but I want to betray. We see that uh, Enta is very much doing whatever he can to ensure that uh, him and Kazuki will be together, even going so far as sabotaging the boys, throwing garbage all over the, um, the underneath of the bridge where they practice soccer so that they can be there together, stealing the, um, the dishes so that they can uh, make sure that Toei leaves and that they can stay together, just Kazuki and Enta. It is all a means to an end for him, and uh, it is it is very clear that when you keep pushing these ideas forward and you keep saying, I'll do whatever it takes so that you can be close to me, it ends up resulting in dangerous things like Enta getting shot. So that is, that is the ultimate consequence of this somewhat selfish idea of doing whatever he can to ensure that his best friend will stay close and potentially get with him. 
And then, of course, chronologically, finally, we have Toei, who goes through everything that allows him to grow, and he doesn't reach the end of his arc until the last episode, really, and kind of the tail end of it, because um, you mm -hmm. could say that he reaches the end of his arc emotionally once the um, action of the present day is done, though I think you could argue mm -hmm. that it's not until after the ending sequence, um, when all the boys reunite, that Toei really mm -hmm. reaches his emotional conclusion. But, like you said earlier, he really has the toughest kind of end out of everyone and mm -hmm. it really weighs on him to the point where he tries to as the show puts it leave the circle he tries to erase himself from existence he tries to destroy the connections at their beginning and he's able to be manipulated by desire otter at his lowest point point. and speaking of desire otter there's quite a bit to dig in there with the uh two cops neo and mabu the cops the cops the class traitors. <laughs> so, Neo and Mabu are interesting in a lot of ways. First and foremost, I think what caught people's attention about them was that these are very clear canon gay characters. Like, they are full-on a couple. Mm -hmm. If you come out of Sarazan, my thinking, no, they were just friends. I'm sorry, but you're in denial. Like, there is no way to argue that these two were not boyfriends. Oh, absolutely. And so then it's also interesting that they are directly being manipulated throughout the series and working for the Desire Otter. Mm -hmm. And of course, in episode 9 and 10, a little bit, we get to see how that came to be in kind of our biggest example of how we see Desire manipulating people. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because in the early series, Reo and Mabu are very clear antagonistic characters. They aren't our big bad, but they are responsible for each of the Kappa zombies that we see uh, in those early episodes. So naturally, we come to associate them with, you know, we, we have a bit of a negative con connotation. But as the series progresses, there is a bit more emphasis placed on them and their interactions, which builds a little bit of intrigue. And come episode 10, we see that they are not otters at all, but Reo and Mabu are in fact Kappas, in the same way that Kepi is a Kappa. And what has happened here is a far more complicated issue. Uh, like Sam explained before, we, we see the truth behind the matter and it is an incredibly unfortunate situation for two people who are clearly in love. They have been separated and turned on one another by this greater force, this desire otter. Their love being almost corrupted in a way. In a sense, they really have had their uh, connections just completely destroyed by desires taking over. Mm -hmm. We see Desire Otter playing them against each other in the sense mm -hmm. that they are both in love with each other and they both are missing vital information. Neo is missing the fact that Mabu literally cannot say that he loves him um, or he will die. And Mabu is missing the fact that Neo believes that he was cheating on him with the Otter. Mm -hmm. And so neither are able to communicate. Now, throughout the show, communication is really vital. Like, it almost goes without saying, but I mean, think about the Sarazanmai, for example. It's the connection of mind, body, and soul. It's the ultimate form of communication because you can no longer stop yourself from communicating the things that are inside you, you know? Mm -hmm. But by taking away their ability to communicate with each other, it takes away their ability to connect and it just causes their relationship to deteriorate further and further and both end up in so much pain and mm -hmm. thus they can be manipulated into doing desire's bidding. Like we explained at the beginning, shame is such an important part of connection in a way because to truly connect with someone, to truly love one another, your shame needs to be exposed. You need to be able to show your truth to the world. So speaking of shame, we get to uh, one of my favorite things to talk about in this show and that's the butt stuff. And now, oh boy. like, as wacky and uncomfortable as it is, it's really actually pretty deep. Mm -hmm. I, I almost- I feel like such a clown saying this, but the butt stuff is deep, you guys. So, why butts? Now let's get into it. Let's answer that question. First of all, we're working with Kappas here, and Kappas, by mythology, like the show kind of says at one point, um, they're water spirits that will suck the Shirikodama out of people's butts. That is an actual part of Japanese mythology. No one made that up for this show. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where the butt thing goes. But why it's implemented in this show is because shame, you know? Why do we get embarrassed when we watch a show like this? It's because shame. It's because uh, the, like, excretory system and everything that goes along with that and that part of our body is something that we're usually taught to be pretty ashamed of, something that we're usually gonna, like, put away and hide, and that's, that's called being decent, you know? 
Like, there's so much yeah. emphasis put on that, and it's it's a source of shame for us, like I said. And so then being confronted with all this is kind of the forceful opening up that we're having to do. It's we're having to confront this embarrassment, this sort this point that makes us so uncomfortable. Because that's the same as revealing your secrets, you know? It's confronting things that make mm-hmm. you uncomfortable that you don't want to show to others. Kepi is a character who is anything but a prude, as we see throughout the entire series. Not only is he the the instigator for this unfortunate ritual that turns the boys into Kappas, oh God. he is also just incredibly He's so much. He's shameless. The way that he goes about his daily life, quote unquote, is, it's humorous to us, the audience, but it also is very clear that he lacks any shame. He does what he wants and he does what he pleases because that's just who he is. And seeing as he is, he is somewhat the ultimate symbol of connection. The Kappas are tied to connecting with one another and extracting desire. So him being the Kappa King makes him the perfect, the perfect sort of being for connection. So this idea that he holds his shame out on his sleeve makes him the perfect candidate for that. So after every Kappa zombie, we get treated to a water tunnel in which the boys do the Sarazanmai, which is the ultimate connection. Mm -hmm. And so now we should probably examine in a little more detail this idea of connection. Like, what does that mean in Sarazanmai, and how do we see it expressed both in the actions, the plotline, and in symbols? So the first and biggest symbol is the chain. We see the chain uh, all the time, and then the chain at the same time is also a circle, which we hear referenced by Haruka most of all. Mm -hmm. So the chain is, of course, representing how everything is interconnected. That's the the chain we see every time a Kappa zombie is defeated and one link is expelled, thus erased. Yes. Chain is just our connection, of course, because every chain link is linked to the next, which is linked to another one, and so on and so forth. So we see that getting used as the symbol of people who are closely connected. For example, um, in the logo of Sarazanmai, we see these three interconnected circles in a chain. That's our three Kappa boys, Toyenta and Kazuki. We also see within the show, um, when Dayo and Mabu are killed, we see them represented as these two interlocking circles. And so then, going further with this idea that I mentioned before of being expelled from that chain, so that's what happens when a Kappa zombie is defeated. They are completely erased from the world, they go outside the circle as it's put in the show. They're yes. no longer connected to anyone, so they no longer exist. In, in each case, when the Kappa zombies are defeated, we see they are erased not only in a literal sense, but in a very real, very metaphorical sense, in that they are completely wiped from the minds of everyone in the world. They are uh, erased from time, in a way, in that no longer is there any memory of the person in question, which early on seems like, okay, whatever, there's very low stakes, but as we get further into the series, it becomes a more real and tangible threat. And this is, in a way, the ultimate way of disconnecting someone from the world. As long as there are still memories of someone, as long as there is still some semblance of an idea of who that person was, you can still connect with that. You can still connect with those ideas in the same way that Toei still has a connection to his parents. Uh, He still holds on to their memory, even though that they are past. So erasing someone completely like this, this is true disconnection. And this is the unfortunate ultimate end of a corrupt desire consuming one person. It is a true disconnect from the world and those around you. Mm -hmm. You focus too much on one thing. You chase after a desire, even though it's harmful to you, even though it's reckless, even though it's damaging your connections with other people, you're going to end up on your own. You're going to end up losing sight of things that are probably more important, you know? Yeah. And then this also kind of ties into something we, a line we hear dropped by Kepi in the first episode, and then we see it play out a little bit further on, which is this idea that as Kappas, they're both kind of as much alive as they are dead. Yes. And so we see that idea play out and that Kappa zombies, just because they are dead, they are already dead people. They they are killed and turned into these zombies. Just because they're mm-hmm. dead, they have that does not erase them. It is their desire being um, assimilated and taken out of the world that destroys them. Yes. Which only happens as a result of them going to the extremes with that desire. Mm-hmm. It's also the work of Dark Kepi, but, you know, uh, and the yeah. Otters, you know, there, there's a whole slew of things going on. There's, there's greater forces at work, but going off of that, the idea of 
desire in excess, being the instigator for disconnection like this. It is very clear that what the show is trying to put forward is this idea of a balance, because no one person is completely free of desire or free of sin, essentially. All of our main characters are guilty of letting desire run their connections and corrupt them in a way. But by exposing themselves and letting their truth be known, they can move forward towards connection. So this balance becomes key. And we actually see this balance very literally represented by the, the merger, the fusion of Kepi and Dark Kepi. They, instead of fighting, instead of one side ultimately winning out against the other, the two merge into one being that is perfectly in harmony. And that is, that is, I think, the ultimate goal of Sarazan Mai, is not to quell your, uh, your desires, but to allow them to be known and to allow them to exist in harmony with your connection. Yeah, for sure. And I think, like, one of the taglines for Sarazan Mai when it was coming out was, desire is your life and don't let go of your desire, which then we hear repeated again in the uh, Otter Cop song, in which they literally just yell right at you, don't let it go of desire, you know? Yeah. And because that's the thing. Uh, yes, desire can be this corrupting force, and we see that it is, and we see it lead people down the wrong path. Fun fact, the name of the desire otter in Japanese is Kawa Uso, which translates literally to river otter, but the otter half mm -hmm. of that, Uso, can also mean lie. Yeah. On top of that, too, the uh, Kawa Uso, the otter in Japanese folklore, they are actually well known as shape-shifting tricksters in the same way that, like, Kitsune are. Uh, there's even specific folklore that tie into otters transforming into beautiful women to trick men, a very literal uh, instance of desire being used to capitalize on those less fortunate. So it is very apt for them to be the opposition of Kappas, uh, especially considering the show has a very heavy emphasis on uh, Japanese folklore. God, I love that Ikuni turns that on its head by, uh, we never see Kawa Uso turn into any beautiful women, we only see him turn into men to seduce people. Yeah. Ikuni said gay rights. <laughs> That's absolutely what this show is. Oh, but getting back to what I was saying there, desire can be a corrupting force, but it doesn't have to be. We see each of the boys end up being able to, to some extent, live with their desire peacefully, you know? Mm -hmm. They don't have to eliminate those wants, they just have to be able to engage with them in a healthy way. Yeah. I think there's an emphasis on taking the energy you would use to pursue a desire and putting it to a better goal, a more healthy goal. Mm -hmm. And I think that's ultimately what the show's trying to go for in that sense. Again, it's it's not, you can't have desires if you feel desires, you're evil. It's rather, desires can be a good thing, just don't let them get out of hand. And so then, going off from that, this idea of using your desires to spur positive change, Neo and Mabu's desires are, part of it at least, is each other. Now, there is some caveats to that in that Neo wants Mabu to kind of be owned by him. He wants Mabu to be the Mabu that he wants, uh, no matter kind of what Mabu is now or how he's changed or hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. But we ultimately do see them kind of not let their desires go and turn them into a positive force at the very end when they yeah. break free of desire and become heroes again and kind of turn that on its head, you know? Yeah. Neo and Mabu get us kind of into some real Ikuni hours with regards to systems of power, which are always part of Ikuni's works. Now, Neo and Mabu, as we've said before, they start out as these very clear villains, but then at the end they are full on assisting the heroes, you know, they're, they've kind of done their turn back to the light. Yeah. And so some people might be a little on edge there still because, hey, these people did kill quite a few guys. Mm -hmm. And so it can be hard to classify Deo and Mabu as antagonists or good guys or villains or what. And that's kind of by design. You know, Ikuni, if you're familiar with his works, he doesn't really like to have clear villains except for um, abstract concepts. Yes, in some cases like this one, very literally abstract concepts. And now, so like, he uses this lack of clear villains to then talk about systems and how they tend to shape people's actions. In this case, we get to see how authority can be corrupted from the inside towards specific goals in the form of police officers. Now, there's quite a lot of hot button stuff with this, so mm -hmm. to keep it more or less brief, Neo and Mabu are simultaneously perpetuating a system that oppresses people while being oppressed by that system. They're suffering while perpetuating. 
if we look at this within the literal context of the show, Reo and Mabu are Kappas who are now working for an, an organization that is run by a literal force that directly opposes and uh, oftentimes attacks this, this group of people. And there is definitely things that can be read in there. There are ties to the real world and how different groups are affected by those in power, but it is an unfortunate reality of the situations that these people are in. In Reo and Mabu's case, they don't quite have a say in the matter. They have become directly affected by their situation and the only way to stay together, the only way to try to stay connected with one another is to unfortunately help a force that directly opposes them. It is not ideal and it is a very unfortunate circumstance, but it is the situation that they find themselves in. Yeah. How that ties into the real world is, you know, it's up to interpretation. Obviously, there are very clear symbols here of power in yeah. that both Reo and Mabu are dressed as police. There, yeah, there but... is definitely a, like a little bit of touching on police violence, though they mm -hmm. don't really end up saying too much about that in particular outside of this is a system that uses its power unjustly at times. And I think like you can't ignore the fact that Rayo and Mabu are benefiting from that system in some way, you know. They're getting mm -hmm. to stay together, which is what they want. They were saved by this system, and so in turn they're going to go do harm to other people for it. You know, they're not just yeah. because they from one angle have to be there does not absolve them of those crimes, but mm. it is, it is, if we're going to engage with this work, we need to be able to recognize that they are still harmed by it. They were in the past and they still are in the present. Mm -hmm. These, these two men are not exempt from the rule of desire within this show. In order to finally connect once again, they need to face the ultimate consequence of their actions here. And in trying to pursue this connection, which is slowly deteriorating, they are actively doing harm to other people who are trying to connect. And when that directly affects them and the force that they're working for turns against them and Mabu becomes a Kappa zombie, that is the last straw. And that is the point where, unfortunately, Mabu loses his life. Both Reo and Mabu lose their life as a result of this. But from those ashes, a stronger connection is born. One that surpasses even death, further proving that this idea of connection is beyond life and death. It is something that exists in sort of all worlds. So long as there is still a memory, so long as there is still some semblance of that connection in the world, then it's still alive. It's still still as strong as ever. Oh, for sure. I think there's really a lot that uh, Deo and Mabu are used for. There's there's quite a bit to them that's also a commentary on how specifically Japanese media uh, treats gay men, though I don't necessarily want to talk about that today just because I don't have the notes for it and I don't want to kind of plagiarize or paraphrase anyone else. Mm -hmm. I might link to some people who are wiser than I who have really dug into that in the description below. Yeah. Also, if we talked about every single thing in this show, it would take all day. No, literally. To kind of get us into this last leg here, we're going to talk about some uh, symbols in the show and what exactly those mean in the context of the greater themes. Yeah. So the first or first two symbols that are reoccurring that I want to talk about here are rivers and bridges. And now one of those is very clear, you know, bridges connect places. They connect places that previously are unreachable, you know, it's very much tying in with the theme of connection. We see these quite a bit. The river is a constant backdrop and so is the bridge that crosses it. Many scenes take place on or near bridges, for example. The spot that Enta and Kazuki practice all the time is right next to a bridge, which is also where young Kazuki received the Masanga from Toei. And it's also where every single Kappa zombie is fought. Yes. Bridges are also where Kappa zombies are fought. We see in episode 10, Neo in the state of mourning Mabu's death uh, is destroying bridges with his gun. Uh, this Literally mm -hmm. the destruction of connections there. It's it's, it's kind of slapping you in the face. Yeah. And so rivers then might seem like they're this idea of like separation, that it's, it's the rivers that separate us. Mm -hmm. But that's not really what it's saying here because rivers and water as a whole are kind of pulling double duty here. Now, like, if you think about it geographically, yes, rivers divide two swaths of land, but at the same time, they're not as if like the world has disappeared. There's still water connecting those two places. And, you know, water is a vital part of economies, it's vital for living, it's very important. You can't really classify water as a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing that 
Sarazanmai does is it makes water kind of a scary positive is the best way I'd put it. Mm -hmm. Water is used to show this kind of like separation, but it's usually like a necessary separation. It's a separation that allows for a connection to form, you know, it's very much tying in with the idea of like, we need to show the parts of ourselves we're ashamed of in order to really deeply connect with other people. Mm -hmm. So now I think the most prominent example of this is of course the, um, the tunnel of water that we see at the end of every uh, Kappa zombie sequence. So this is very much, the three boys are at their height of connection here. They perform the Sarazan Mai, which is the ultimate connection inside the tunnel of water. So how does that separate them? Well, uh, when they perform the Sarazan Mai, they have to confront their fears. They have to confront the things they're ashamed of. And sometimes the knee-jerk reaction people have is to draw away. Like the first time when it's revealed that Kazuki is dressing up as Sada, his immediate reaction is to reject the others, even Enta who is saying like, oh, you know, it's, it's, I'm fine with it. Yeah. It's because, you know, it's, it's he's something he's ashamed of. But had he not revealed that to the boys, forcibly or not, he never would have gotten over it. He never would have received support from them in the long run. Mm -hmm. Water is this necessary barrier. Think of it this way. If we didn't have rivers, we wouldn't have any need for bridges. And bridges are what connect us. Bridges are literally yeah. our connections here. But without these scary things we have to confront, without these pieces of shame, we would never really be able to connect. There would never be a need for connection there. Yeah, absolutely. You have to kind of throw yourself in head first in order to keep those connections strong. And sometimes that takes a very literal meaning in a lot of the cases where we see the boys throwing themselves into the water, like in the one of the last scenes in the show. Toei throws himself off the bridge into the water below and who is he met by but Kazuki and Enta? And that is a, you know, it's it's a it's a tough thing to do to jump off of a bridge into the water. It's there's a lot to read into there, but it is the the final way that he can connect with his friends. From that point, they are stronger than ever. Their connections are true and honest and only grow from there. So on top of that, there is also another sort of, another way that the water has connected people in the past. Uh, one of the, the biggest connections early on, especially early on in the timeline is the connection between Toei and Kazuki, which sort of instigates a lot of the, uh, a lot of the stuff within the show. After all the stuff that happens with Jikai and after Toei kills a man, he is willing to give up the one thing that he loved the most, tossing his soccer ball and his Misanga into the water, which in turn passes it on to Kazuki. This forms an obvious connection, even though water is initially considered to be this separator, but that brings us to what I feel is one of the stronger pieces of symbolism within the show, the Misanga itself which the, the show sort of explains that it's a, uh, it's sort of like a friendship bracelet type thing that is often worn by uh, people who play soccer. Uh, so it is tied to the sport in a sense, but it is also our, uh, our main connector. It is, it is the means by which the three boys are connected. And obviously there are parallels that you can make when you have a, an object like this that is what allows these people to connect with one another and allows the show, essentially the plot of the show to happen. Uh, this is essentially our apple from Penguin Drum. Now, there are also a lot of other references to Penguin Drum throughout the series, like episode six, for instance, I feel is probably the strongest and most blatant Penguin Drum reference. There's the adoption narrative pushed forward with the uh, with Haruka and Kazuki. Uh, the, the, they, they are essentially in like an industrial hellscape when they are saving Haruka. There are boxes, boxes everywhere. We see like a literal child broiler from Penguin Drum. Uh, there's like all of these things. Even with the child broiler, we see the same sort of like sparkly glass dust being ground out of it. Um, mm -hmm. It's really like a clear nod to Penguin Drum. You, you can't deny that the aesthetics are there especially with um, background people being shown the same way that they're shown in Penguin Drum. Albeit this time in Sarazanmai, they have more traditional hairstyles, which again ties in with the prevalence of Japanese mythology. And so going back to the Misanga in question here, the, the main symbol of our connection, it is constantly thrown around between uh, our three boys, uh, connecting them together, but also sort of representing where each of the boys is at with respect to their own arcs 
Uh, so initially within the show, it is it is held by Toei and it is given away to Kazuki after Toei fires a gun and kills a man for his brother. That is the the desire taking over and the connection essentially becoming clouded. So the Misanga gets passed on to Kazuki, who in turn invests himself into soccer and forms a honest and true connection with Enta, uh, forming the golden duo. The two of them are good friends and soccer buddies for a long time, but after Kazuki inadvertently causes Haruka's accident, uh, that Misanga is thrown away, which begins the desire clouding up Kazuki's situation with his younger brother. Then, after Haruka finally digs out the Masanga and passes it to Enta, he allows Kazuki to get it in a time of most need, when Kazuki needs to, you know, own up and save his brother from the uh, the Otter Cops, allowing him to once again be truly connected to his younger brother. So it's passed around all a bunch, and each time it gets passed around and each person who possesses it, they finally become connected again with those that they are wanting to connect to. And that, of course, culminates in kind of, like, connecting the chain fully into a big circle in that the boys then pass the uh, Masanga back to its initial moments so that the, again, the chain can be completed. Uh, they can mm -hmm. kind of preserve that connection and be sure that it's always there even after Toei kind of throws himself outside the circle and tries to delete everything. Yeah. And it's very beautiful. And we get even more uh, references to various Ikuni works there. We get this whole landslide, um, starting with Neo and Mabu turning into a star that resembles Kumaria exploding, followed by the Duelist Gate, followed by um, the path that Himari slash the Princess of the Crystal walks down. And it's just very good, just like dripping with Ikuni fan service. And I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Like overall, this show, it, it's definitely a strong contender for one of my favorite Ikuni works. It hasn't quite topped Penguin Drum, but it's, it's very close. And the fact that it not only has such a strongly constructed narrative with all of these wonderful cases of symbolism, but the fact that it also is, you know, incredibly self-aware and gives the people all of these fun references to the earlier works. It's 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 a pleasure to see from someone like Ikuhara, who, you know, it's it's plain to see he is having fun with this. I remember an interview where he said that he didn't tell anyone about all the butt stuff when he initially pitched the show, and so he he was gonna get scolded for it but he didn't mind. It is easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. It is easier to put some very weird shit on television than ask for permission. Exactly. So yeah, overall, Sarazanmai is just this really wonderful show that it has been such a pleasure to not only watch as it came out, but to rewatch and to restudy all of these little things. That is, it, it, it is the true weight, I think, to experience an Akuni work. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Is to just watch it and then rewatch it and rewatch it like, because you get so much value from ex re-exploring the series within a different context while you understand the ending. It's, yeah. It is really, really wonderful, and it, it really just informs a lot about how much work and how much time and effort goes into creating these works by Ikuhara. You could say that um, he makes sure all his works are really uh, connected. And that's all the time we have, <laughs> folks. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. That was very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for watching, guys. Great show. If uh, you watch this without seeing it, you need to go watch this show now. Those are the laws. I don't mm -hmm. make them. I just decide what they are. Um, Absolutely. If you have watched it once, watch it twice. It's really easy. It's only 11 episodes. And, you know, mm -hmm. like, if there's anything we didn't talk about, uh, feel free to comment below. I'd love to hear what you all think or some details I didn't pick up on that other people might have. But, yeah, mm -hmm. tell us what you think. Thank you guys so much for checking this out. I hope you have a really awesome day. See ya. Bye.